the world, the world's writers will walk through those gates. And uh, if you hang around, you get a chance to talk to them. I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, that real, you know, how do we live our lives? First of all, make climate change personal in your life. The second step is get angry and get active. And the third step, and believe it or not, I think this is the most important. We have to imagine this world that we want to hurry towards. But kindness is looking at people as people and not as, I voted this, I do this, whatever it is. There are some people we will never get along with, but most of us, most of us are a complex mass of different things. Hello, I'm Ian Rankin. Uh, I've been with the Edinburgh International Book Festival basically since day one. I went as a student, as a reader, as a fan of writing. Uh, later on, I was invited to go as an author, which was a thrill. And it's a spectacular experience. It's a meeting of minds. It's a way to open your mind to new experiences, to new ideas, nuanced debate, entertainment, something for every age group. And that's what keeps me going back year after year after year. Long may it continue. Good morning and welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. I'm Val McDermott and I'm here this morning to talk to Stuart Cosgrove. Uh, welcome Stuart. Thanks Lovely Sal. You Lovely to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Stuart is a man who needs no introduction here in Scotland, but for the wider population who don't tune in on Saturdays to Off the Ball, his spirited and eccentric radio show about Scottish football, I'll attempt to give a flavour of the man. <laughs> As a journalist, among other jobs, he was media editor of the New Musical Express. That's NME for the younger people among you. Uh, as a television executive, he spent eight years as controller of arts on Channel 4, then moved upwards to be head of programmes. As a broadcaster, as well as off the ball, he presents a weekly podcast on talk media and many other things too. As a writer, he's recently carved out a niche as an expert on soul music with Young Soul Rebels and the subsequent trilogy, Detroit 67, Memphis 68 and Harlem 69. I could go on, but we need to get on to the subject of today's event, which is his newly published book, Cassius X, an account of 14 crucial months in the life of man, often regarded as the greatest sportsman of the 20th century. It opens in the new year of 1963 with John F. Kennedy visiting Miami, where 21-year-old Cassius Clay was starting his assault on the pinnacle of heavyweight boxing. And it ends days after he claimed the world heavyweight title and announced his transformation to Muhammad Ali. Stuart, could you give us a wee flavour of the book? Yes, um, the book, as you say, is a book that kind of... Uh follows a lot of my kind of passions, uh, one of which, as you've uh, indicated, is the history and the evolution uh, of soul music. So the little bit of reading I'm actually going to do is early in the book. Uh, and to some extent, uh, rather than being a biography of Muhammad Ali, it's very much using those uh, months of his life to witness the evolution and development of, of soul music, the, if you like, the first days of soul. 
Since his teenage days back home in Louisville, Cassius had cultivated an interest in local radio and was a fan of the irrepressible Jack the Rapper Gibson, the madcap maven of radio station WLOU in Louisville. It was Jack Gibson who kindled Cassius's teenage love of comic rhyming couplets and primitive rap music. Gibson also played the role of Jack the Jockey, a larger-than-life persona who came to life during the Kentucky Derby, dressed in jockey silks and a riding helmet and carrying a comedy whip. Gibson was an unaccredited character in the formation of Cassius's cartoon personality. Born in Chicago, Gibson's first experience on the crackling radios of the post-war era was as an actor. He played supporting roles in short radio dramas where his skin colour was an irrelevance in the segregated days of popular entertainment. He subsequently moved south to Atlanta where he broadcast for a local radio station from a makeshift, st makeshift studio above the offices of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the civil rights organisation led by Dr Martin Luther King. Gibson became a prominent political figure in the campaign to secure improved pay and conditions for black DJs as the influence of R&B spread throughout America. Every sizable urban station uh, city had an R&B radio station that brought black music to teenage homes, creating local stars who moved effortlessly from nightclubs to broadcasting. What they shared with Cassius was a flashy playfulness, comic arrogance, and a relish for black dance music as it progressed from R&B to soul. In his leisure time, Cassius often pretended to be a DJ and stored up rhyming couplets from the radio to be used in his own life as he boasted his way up the heavyweight rankings. At midday, when the sun was at its hottest, he sometimes took to the darkened stage of the Night Beat, a club in Miami, to play the role of the in-house MC. In March 1963, after his fight with Doug Jones, his management team lived up to a promise and bought the young boxer a tomato red Cadillac Eldorado car, which was fitted with a record player sold under the brand name Norelco. The device could take a single 45 slid into its gaping mouth. As Cassius drove, he cheerily rapped uh, his own introductions to the latest soul records, whilst his loyal brother Rudy acted as the technician, feeding the next single into the device. And I could go on, but the, 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 the real purpose of this is to actually try to understand how Cassius's personality evolved and how the person that we now know as Muhammad Ali first derived all of that kind of boastfulness comic arrogance, exaggeration, self-aggrandizement, which of course became part of the thoroughfare that led ultimately to rap music as well. And I, I, love, I love that wee bit in the book when I was reading it, it made me smile, the idea of this tomato red car with yeah. the feeding the sing singles into the in-car in player. I yeah. tell you, they must have had a lot fewer potholes in Miami than we have these days. <laughs> well, exactly, because <laughs> you know, his brother was the kind of technician and <laughs> yeah. you, know, you just think, well, uh, even cassettes were a nightmare to play in a car, let alone 45 RPM records, yeah. you know. And I think it's, it, this, the reading actually typifies what, what is at the heart of this book. So often biography, memoir, focuses on the great life at the centre of yeah. it. But what you've done is draw in threads from all sorts of elements of, yeah. of uh, Cassius's life. And I'm going to come back to that later on. But at first glance, this seems an odd choice of subject after immersing yourself in the history of soul music. Why this particular book? Well, at one level, um, I, I kind of agonised over um, where to go next after the trilogy. And there was quite a lot of kind of people saying to me, well, jump forward to Philadelphia in, in the 1970s when Philly International and, and disco was at its height. And, uh, you know, Philadelphia was one of the cities gripped uh, in the AIDS pandemic. So there was quite a lot to kind of write about there. And I thought about it. And then actually I thought about jumping back to uh, Chicago in the year 1966, where an awful lot of things were happening uh, in the city and its own music was flourishing. But it felt as if I'd done a trilogy and to say, oh, and here's the bit I forgot about, uh, it felt like the wrong way. And when I was uh, working on earlier in the era and I started to think about maybe Cassius as a witness to the early days of Soul, I started to imagine it as a prequel to the trilogy. So although you don't need to have read the trilogy, 
to have read this, to read this book. And actually, with the trilogy, you don't need to have read any one of them in any order. They're all self-standing books. But that was what my first thought was. I like the idea, rather than, as you say, a biography or a memoir, the idea that your central character is witnessing things as he goes through his own life. And it's a remarkable life as well, not least of which is his conversion to uh, Nation of Islam in the latter parts of 1963. You know. Yeah, and that kind of brings me on to the next question, really, which is why Cassius X? What yeah, does well, that mean? Okay, so Cassius X is an interesting uh, question, that, uh, and in many respects, people don't fully kind of know this about his biography. But he was met in 1962 on the sides of a street um, in a place called Overtown in Miami by uh, a famous um, Nation of Islam uh, recruiter called Sam Saxon. And he was the, the fisher of men. Uh, and Sam spoke to Muhammad Ali, as was, uh, and uh, as is, uh, and brought him up to date and said to him, you know, do you know about the nation? Can we talk? And he was invited into his hotel room and listened to Cassius boasting about all of his achievements. And they sat and they talked and they talked. And gradually he became interested in the idea of joining the Nation of Islam. Now, for about six months, he was going into a very, very small mosque in Miami where he would pray and where he would go through the rituals of his, uh, of his faith. But he hadn't fully converted. And the conversion process to Nation of Islam is not simple. You have to go through uh, months and months of training, of spiritual guidance, of uh, copying out details of the history of the movement. Uh, and one of the first things that you're expected to do is to cancel or eliminate your slave name. Uh, and his slave name was Clay. So he was Cassius Marcellus Clay. And there's a bit in the book when he goes to his First Nation of Islam uh, fundraiser. It's actually a campaign, a rally in Detroit in 1962, just as kind of Motown's emerging. Um, and he uh, listens to all the great speakers. It's the first day he meets Malcolm X, the famous uh, firebrand um, figure of the Nation of Islam. And uh, of course, when he applied to join, or when he moved in the gener generation of joining, he was asked to get rid of Clay and become Cassius X. However, <laughs> and this is very interesting, Cassius Marcellus Clay, if you're still with me, ancestrally was one of the leaders of the abolition movement in Kentucky. He was a slave owner, but he, he, he released his slaves very early and then became a very strong advocate of abolition, ran a printing press, was a, was a pamphleteer, uh, stood at meetings, raged against the whole uh, concept of slavery. And over the years, through his, his father, who's an interesting character uh, in the book, Cassius became slightly enamored by this ancestor. He, he's a positive guy, he's a progressive guy. I'm not sure I want to get rid of this name. I've grown up with this name. It's, it's a fantastic name. I love my name. And it's, it's really interesting when you ask people to talk about changing their name, even in something like, for example, marriage or a, a commitment to um, changing their name if they go through uh, uh, ideological or, or, or religious spiritual change. It's actually sometimes for some people quite a, a challenging thing to do, to eliminate part of what you might consider to be your personality. But you're required to take on uh, the denial of your slave past before you can fully progress through Nation of Islam. The interesting thing of why X, well, X is the way of eliminating your, your surname, uh, but he was Cassius and he was the only person in the, uh, in the mosque in Miami that was passing through conversion. And so he was Cassius X. Malcolm X, when he was in Lansing in Michigan, was the only Malcolm at his mosque. If you are, for example, called John or, or William, you, there might be 14 in front of you. So actually, one of the people that assassinated Malcolm X was called something like William 15X Bradley, you know, because <laughs> there, there are 14 other Xs yeah. in front of you or 14 other Williams in front of you. So, so that's the reason why Cassius X. But I also was looking as well to try and make sense of the era within which he was converting. Uh, because not everyone really knew that he was joining the Nation of Islam. Although, curiously, when you see some of the early photographs of him taken 
even as far back as late 1961, you see him in black suits with bow ties. Not the most conventional way for a young African-American man to be dressing at that time. And some of even his applications for fight licenses put forward by his own management uh, contained images of him in bow ties or in tight black uh, ties of the time. And so there's an indication there of him dressing differently as he moved through conversion. And it was only after um, he'd won the heavyweight championship against Sonny Liston that the Nation of Islam, fearing that he might go off with Malcolm X to a new startup militant organization, immediately announced that he would be called Muhammad Ali and that he was in the faith, you know. Yeah. So that's why Cassius X. Yeah. It was, it was clearly, uh, the, the period of this book was clearly, I mean, I hate these sort of terms, but it was a journey yeah. for him yeah. to go from the name that he was proud of, that was his family name, that, that yeah. had connections for him, that were obviously deep connections, yeah. to ending up as Muhammad Ali. That was yeah. a, a big journey. Uh, but the book also takes us on, as we've hinted at here, a, a journey through the period. Uh, he brushed against so many key elements of the time, black civil rights, the emerging power of black music, yeah. even Beatlemania and yeah. J. Edgar Hoover. Yeah. Uh, can, you, can you take us through these connections? Was, was there something he sought out or was it things that were drawn to him because he increasingly became an attractive Visible, figure? Yeah. I, I mean, I think first and foremost, there's a kind of circumstantial thing that he was growing up in an era and that era gave rise to all of these various things. If if you t stay with the civil rights one for a moment, um, he was one of a generation of uh, young people uh, that had lived through uh, the lynching and brutalization of a young Chicago gospel singer called Emmett Till. Now, Emmett Till, as I said, is from Chicago, and he'd been in gospel singing competitions with Sam Cooke, with Curtis Mayfield, and he'd gone one summer to his uh, grandmother's home in Mississippi, in the Mississippi Delta, where, according to the story, he went into a local uh, store, a village store, and flirted with a white woman who was in the queue uh, to be served. She had gone home and reported this to her husband, and a gang of people came and abducted Emmett Till at midnight the next day and took him and, and murdered him, brutalised him, lynched him, and the death of Emmett Till became famous because Emmett Till's mother made the decision that she wasn't going to accept her son's death without fighting back. And so she went to Jet Magazine, which was a society magazine based in Chicago where they lived, and gave them the photographs and invited the publishers to publish these photographs of her dead son on the cover. Now, I've probably interviewed all the major uh, soul stars of the kind of era, and particularly the surviving ones, members of the Supremes, the Temptations, the Four Tops, Stevie Wonder, you know, and when you sit down at Berry Gordy, who owned Motown, frequently they would refer to the cover of Jet Magazine that had Emmett Till on the cover. And almost all of them would say that their mother, their father or their mother, would bring them into the house, show them it, scare them with this image and sit down and say, you have to be very, very careful out there. There are ugly, horrible people that do not like you being young and black. Uh, and to some extent, a term that was used within the racist South was the term uppity. And the idea was that Cassius's mother in particular was very, very worried that her son was showing some of the same cheeky characteristics that had led to Emmett Till's death. And so she, again, sat him down, talked to him about this. And for him, it was one of the kind of wake up calls about how do you deport yourself in public when you're at risk of being murdered or abducted? And, and you know, that's something that, you know, he had gone through that through almost lessons at his mother's kind of uh, table. Um, and in some respects, his journey through civil rights was remarkable. Uh, he himself became possibly more uh, known as a, 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 a as a radical activist after refusing to fight in the draft in Vietnam. And that's later in the 60s. Mm. But interestingly enough, because he was based in Miami, he was based in Miami because that's where his gym was that he trained and his uh, boxing manager, Angelo Dundee, was based. Um, but um, I, I, as he lived in Florida for four or five years, uh, he became aware of the so-called wade-in-the-water 
uh, demonstrations. Now, Wade in the Water, it's, it's, it's almost disappeared from the history of civil rights now, because most of the civil rights campaigns were aware of are Rosa Parks refusing to uh, give up her seat on the bus, or their Martin Luther King going to jail in Birmingham, Alabama, or it's maybe about uh, recently uh, John Lewis crossing the Pettus Bridge at Selma. All of these are big, iconic moments in the history of civil rights. But Cassius um, was a witness to the Wade and the Water ones. The, 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 the beaches in Miami and the beaches in Florida were at the time of his arrival still segregated. Uh, and the civil rights campaign were saying, young black people go to the beaches and wade in the water, deny the restrictions, don't let civic uh, ordinances prevent you from enjoying paddling in the water, wading in the water. There's a great, great Ramsey Lewis uh, jazz instrumental called Wade in the Water, and it's based on those campaigns. And every time I listen to that, you just think, can I, is it possible that an instrumental record can be so persuasive, so powerful, so political, you know? The yeah, is yes. and, and for, for most of us who are, may well be familiar with Wade in the Water as, yeah. a, as a piece of music, that backstory was completely unfamiliar to me until yeah. I read this book. Yeah. So, I mean, that's one of the great joys of this book. It's full of these nuggets, these yeah. moments where you just go, oh, that makes sense of that. Now I get that. Now I get yeah. it, yeah, yeah. I understand. Yeah. I've never understood why that was a thing, but yeah. now I do. Um, I, I, mean, I think it's, it's, it's like in, in, in the scene, in, in the line of the detective crime fiction, it's like planting little kind of plot moments that come back yeah. to be resolved at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, I, I, it's, it's kind of depressing, isn't it, that uh, it's still pretty much as dangerous to be a young black man in America now as it was back in the 50s and 60s yeah, in many yeah, respects. Yeah, um, I mean, the wake-up call for me as a you know, a white Scottish guy of a certain age, you know, as I research and, and deep dive into these books, you know, the, 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 you know, the amount of things that I've written about where you just simply think that's Black Lives Matter. That is exactly the essence of what this is about, about yeah. the dangers that young black men in particular, but any citizen is exposed to in, in a racist context and not just with the police. In this case, it was with a, a lynch mob, basically, you know. And it's shaming that change has been so slow. Yeah, uh, and, you know, and really, really slow, painfully yeah, slow. Yeah. Yeah. Can, uh, to go back to Cassius' involvement with the Nation of Islam, what do you think it was that drew him to the more uh, extreme separatist ideas of Malcolm X, for example, rather than the, the route that Dr King took? Yeah. What, 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 was, uh, what was that kind of split in the civil rights movement? And, and know, why do you, you think know, he went one way rather than the other? I think that's one of the things that may never be answered. Um, I, I try to answer it in the book, but whether I successfully do that or not, I'm not sure, because there is uh, a moment where um, Cassius was a phenomenally gifted high school boxer, right, at the age of, say, 14, 15. Um, and his classmate, or one of his classmates, is a guy called Jimmy Ellis. Now, Jimmy Ellis ends up boxing after... Cassius has refused the draft from Vietnam. Jimmy Ellis is one of the guys that's coming forward to fight for his title in a series of elimination bouts. And Jimmy features quite prominently in the book because, interestingly enough, he, when he's not boxing himself for his own career, he's Cassius's uh, sparring partner. So he witnesses a lot of what's going on. But Jimmy, who himself was a hugely gifted gospel singer, ended up recording for Atlantic Records, um, when he was a child growing up, he was so orientated towards the church much more than Cassius was, and he witnessed all of this, and certainly there are conversations between them where Jimmy just wouldn't give any ground uh, on his Christianity. And clearly there was kind of debates about those, uh, about that. His girlfriend, Cassius's girlfriend, Dee Dee Sharp, who was a soul singer for um, Cameo Parkway Records in Philadelphia, and she was probably the female uh, partner to Chubby Checker when they were doing Dance Craze records together in the early 60s. She claims that they were planning to get married, but her refusal to move towards Islam broke their relationship. So all of that was in there. But his aunt makes a remark quite early in the book where Jimmy Ellis and him go to Chicago to fight in the Golden Gloves. The Golden Gloves is the kind of amateur high school tournament for the best boxers across uh, America. And they're there, they actually end up winning the tournament, uh, Central High School, Louisville. So they go, Jimmy and Cassius are the two top boxers, end up being two of the greatest boxers of their era. And they win the, the, the tournament. And on the last day before they head back in their coach back to uh, Louisville, they go shopping. 
and Cassius goes into a record shop and comes out with a whole set of records. He loved his, his, his records. And one of the ones that he'd bought was by um, uh, a then Calypso singer who ended up becoming Louis Farrakhan, one of the leaders of the Nation of Islam. And so he'd been clearly aware of the Nation of Islam um, long before this book begins, probably when he was 16 year old. And whether it intrigued him or whether he, you know, sometimes in life when you're younger, you don't necessarily analyze all of the kind of strengths and weaknesses of an organization. You can be swept along by the kind of, if you like, the romance or the militancy or the, you know, unexpurgated clarity of what they're saying. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I remember as a kid growing up, uh, for me, ban the bomb was a great slogan. I, and I was living in Perth. I had no idea about Canon Collins or the Committee 100 or why these people were against nuclear disarmament. It was just a great badge, a great slogan, and I went for it. I suspect there was a wee bit of that with Cassius. They're the real deal. Yeah. Martin Luther King's a kind of older gradualist. These guys are saying, give us it now or we'll do you. you know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it seemed to me that you kind of see the emergence of black music as a kind of social glue. Yes. It was a way of bringing people together yeah. uh, and acting as a focus. Yeah. Would, that, would that be fair? I, I think it would. And, and in lots of ways, I also always see it as being diverse and in the truest sense of that word because the forms of music that he's witnessing are many and varied. There's the, there's the Sam Cooke and the civil rights anthems like A Change Is Gonna Come. But there's also, interestingly enough, his girlfriend, Dee Dee Sharp, is actually a dance craze singer. She's uh, a partner to a Chubby Checker. In fact, she has a very, very big hit called Mashed Potato USA, where you do the mashed potato and I'll, you know, you know how you mash potatoes, that's the kind of dance. Go on, Stuart, craze. go on, get us a wee dance. There you go, there you go, do the mashed potato, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, in, in some respects, um, I, I, I was conscious that Cassius had all of those things around him and his record collection reflected all of those things. But what really, really kind of ignited him was the idea of showiness. The one thing that surprised me when I was researching it, I, I had no idea about this, he was actually a, a relatively gifted close-up magician. You know, Cassius could do little tricks, whether it was with cards, coins, um, he had a, a walking stick that would turn into an umbrella, stuff like that, and when he packed his bag, there was always tricks thrown into it. And I think he was one of these guys that just loved attention, thrived in it. And of course, you, you see many photographs, extant photographs of him walking down the street, hundreds of children around him, Pied Piper stuff. And it was because he could make, you know, a nickel or a dime appear behind their ear and, you know, and kids love all of that. Yeah. And I think Cassius played to that, that uh, yeah. dynamic. And that does seem at odds, that kind of razzle dazzle, does mm. seem at odds with the intense seriousness yes, of the, the nation of Islam. I mean, yeah. there's not a lot of laughs no. in the, the nation of Islam, it no. seems to me. No, there, uh, they, they, and, and there's yet, not. But at the same time as well, uh, there is clarity. And I think that he had arrived at a point where he believed that his blackness was the equivalent or, the, uh, or had a value that allowed or should allow him access to anywhere in America. He, he shouldn't need to wait on fame or celebrity or some other key to opening the door. Yeah. And I think that the Nation of Islam were the most clear manifestation of that, you know. Yeah. Another one of these moments when I was reading the book where I suddenly went, Oh my God, that was happening at the same time. Yeah. Was when he goes to England. Yes. And he comes to England at the height of the perfume affair. <laughs> well, it's Which, you, know, you don't make that connection no, in you your don't. head. I, mean, I certainly curiously hadn't. Curiously enough, there's a failure here in the history of British sports writing because he comes to box Henry Cooper in the June of 1963. And it's known only in tabloid speak now as the time when Henry Cooper floored Cassius X. Um, and he was actually Cassius X at the time, they would call him Cassius Clay. And he, um, and, and of course he then gets up and just murders Henry Cooper. I mean, there's no contest at all, but for somehow in the patriotic tabloid journalism of Britain, Henry Cooper has kind of did something special then. And in lots of ways seen against that most people in America don't even know he went there, you know? Yeah. But what I do, and what, what's kind of quite interesting in the book, was it was one of the few times where he was struggling 
to convince the media that he was the star act. And one of the reasons for that is every single newspaper in the UK was focusing on the Profumo affair and on Mandy Rice Davis and Christine Keeler coming up to court. And they come up to court, curiously enough, because of a really low level kind of fight between uh, two West Indian uh, gangsterish guys that are in London uh, who they've met and know from the Flamingo Club in Soho. And the Flamingo Club, um, where I've got great photographs of Cassius outside the club on the all-nighter, solo all-nighter. So jealous of that night. You imagine you could have gone to a solo all-nighter and Cassius was there, you know. And he's standing outside, loads of people hoarding around him. But interestingly enough, downstairs is where soul music is being to really kind of percolate in the UK in a kind of new way. So Georgie Fame and the Blue Flames are the house band. You've got all of these visiting American and Jamaican artists. There's the mods or the other dominant force within it. Uh, black GIs, uh, West Indian kind of hoodlums and a whole range of different people. And I think it's a very interesting uh, chapter because it, pl it, it puts him against a backdrop that is not the civil rights. It's, it's a different country dealing with blackness in, in, in its own unique way, you know. In a, in a different kind of way, it, it brings a it brings him into a different focus back in America. Yeah. As well, there was a quote that I, I noticed in Sports Illustrated yeah. talking about that trip to, to London, which I yeah. thought was very, very telling. He said, Cassius in England applied the economic theory he had found so workable in the US to sweeten the gate, you must first sour the people. Yeah. What do you make of that? Well, I think that there's an element of some um, uh, truth in that. I think that it derives from the idea that Cassius during this period and in the run-up to his refusal to fight in Vietnam was a deeply, deeply divisive personality. The mainstream of boxing, which is unbelievably conservative and run almost entirely by uh, white people and businessmen uh, and gangsters, uh, they despised Cassius, utterly despised him. Uh, and the amount of stick that he got from columnists, he was seen as a mouth, he was seen as, he, he, he was seen as um, thin, not, not credible enough, a fake, you know, all of these things that were le leapt on him. And he had to some extent soured the gate, if you like, you know, if the gate was the gate of inclusion into heavyweight boxing, he was seen as one of the least uh, like, liked or likable people. But curiously enough, was also the biggest noise, the big name, the, the razzmatazz that boxing thrives on. The irony was that the vast majority of the mainstream of boxing, of the white conservative culture that ran boxing, wanted Sonny Liston to beat him. And Sonny Liston was, of course, a, you know, a notorious criminal. He was a convicted bank robber. He was he had brutalized police officers. I mean, you couldn't have got a worse advert for uh, humanity than Sonny Liston. Uh, and yet he still wanted him to beat Cassius. I think that speaks volumes. And yet in the book, you actually paint another side of Sonny Liston as well. You give a very generous portrait yeah. of the other face of Sonny Liston yeah. that we didn't yeah. know about. Yeah, uh, about I, a, a man who was kind, who was shy, who was generous, who was smart. Yeah, I, 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 I'm glad you noticed that, Val, because in some respects, one of the things that I've tried to do throughout the trilogy and indeed carrying over to this book is to look at what the dominant discourse is about someone and try to pick away at it and find counter arguments. Uh, I did it in Detroit 67 with Barry Gordy, who, if you're looking for the cartoon version of him, you know, he's the evil manipulative uh, record company owner who is a puppet master with all of the acts and exploits them all. In actual fact, that only some of that is true. And even the bits that are true are not true for the reasons that um, people ascribe to him. There, there's a scene in Detroit 67, which I'm hugely proud of, that I kept returning to time and time again. And what has happened is that um, Barry Gordy has bought this house um, called the Motown Mansion, it's called now. It's a big mansion up in the historic area of Detroit. And um, his sisters, who loved really ripping the piss out of him, had got this uh, local artist to do a portrait of Gordy but in the style of Napoleon, right? So they've, <laughs> so they've got this portrait of him, which is about Clutching. his ego, his attitude, yeah, doing all the Napoleon thing. And um, uh, it's hung up in the, the wall. 
Now, the day, or one of the days, of, there's probably about 20 days when Florence Ballard was supposedly sacked by Motown, most biographers portray um, Berry Gordy walking down this flight of stairs past the Napoleon uh, portrait, coming down and leaving Florence Ballard in tears, sacking her from the Supremes. She continued to sing for the Supremes for another eight months after that, which is one you know, flaw in the argument. The second flaw in the argument, and by far away the biggest one, is he hadn't actually bought the house until a year later. So, <laughs> uh, so this was all the constructed fantasies and fictions yeah. of writers that wanted to portray him as purely evil, uh, narcissistic, um, controlling, uh, and, and sort of dictatorial. And I kind of saw him more as being, having worked at Channel 4 for as long as I did, I thought, what if I cast Barry Gordy as an independent producer? Because I spent an awful lot of my time banging on doors inside and outside Channel 4 trying to say, let's give more visibility to independent producers in the nations and regions of Britain. And I, I, one of my biggest arguments, I always say, is the most successful regional production company in the world ever was Motown. It was based in Detroit and it became a global organization. And I saw him really as the producer had all of these kind of tensions to deal with. Uh, and I, I think I cast him as a very different personality than was the case. And equally with Cassius, or rather with Sonny Liston, I see Sonny Liston as being a man with uh, phenomenal uh, IQ, way, way above um, most other citizens, way, way above Cassius, uh, and certainly way above what the um, norm would have been in an American penitentiary at the time. But he's also clearly someone who is, is quite a kind of solitary figure, maybe easily exploited because simply his solitariness doesn't lead to him being very clubby. He's not someone that kind of hangs about with businessmen and does the backslapping and all of that. I mean, he's clearly a very kind of uh, prone to significant violence. But you sometimes wonder with Sonny Liston as you're looking at him, was there something about him that may even have been spectrum in the, se in, in the sense that he is so rigidly a loner at times that you sometimes wonder about what he, he would be diagnosed if he was diagnosed by modern diagnosis now. You know that Cassius had ADHD, that there's absolutely no doubt about that. He would have been ascribed that at school because of his just yeah. his behavior in the classroom alone. Sonny Liston, much, much harder to determine, but certainly not the kind of ugly, you know, vile man that history has, has kind of uh, written him as. And that, that, makes, that makes kind of sense, you know, talking about uh, possible spectrum, because he was a, a 24th of 25 kids. Yeah. You can hardly yeah. believe that. It's very hard to be a loner yeah. when you're in a family of 25 kids. That's right. Yeah. blunt about exactly. it. Exactly. And he did a runner when he was 14 and yeah. took to the streets of um, St. Louis, where he, he grew up as a street hoodlum, basically. Mm. But it's, it's odd that he didn't have... There isn't anything where you could point to Sonny Liston uh, until he goes to jail and is, it's discovered that he's got the capacity to box, there isn't anything about him that you think, why, why, why did he do those things? He was v very much a victim of circumstance yeah, in that sense. I know. think so. You read yeah. that and you, just, and you do your right, see it in a very different light. Yeah. Mm. Uh, boxing was a dirty game and we've, we've yeah. accepted that. Uh, it was notorious for squeezing the last drops out of its fighters and then yeah. leaving them on the scrap heap. But, but Cassius, was, was, uh, he, had, he had too much acumen for that to happen. Yeah. He, he learned from the people around him. Yeah. The Louisville sponsoring group, the, yeah. the group of white businessmen that held his contracts yeah. at the start of his career. Yeah. And Sam Cooke, the, the musician and producer, yeah. who taught him a lot about controlling your image, controlling, controlling your, rights, your rights, making sure yourself. you got paid. Yeah. 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 Um, well, why, do you think that was, why do you think he made, managed to make that different from so many of his, his fellow boxers? Well, I think, again, I return back to, to black music. At that, that moment, in that historical moment, 62, 63, you have Sam Cooke, um, who owns, his own, uh, owns and controls his own record company. His personal singing contract is with RCA, but he owns uh, an organisation called SAR Records, who are based in the LA, and he brings out records and the copyright is his, and therefore the money that returns in a cruise is, is almost entirely his, with his business partner, J.W. Alexander. Derry Gordy was doing almost exactly the same thing in Detroit uh, with Motown, building up the organisation with his two sisters, 
from a from a home that had this amazing kind of uh, black capitalist kind of instinct of, of growing businesses and thriving uh, and to some extent here were two major characters in black music that were in control of their own identity and in control of their own business and I think Cassius was of the age where he could see that recognize that and begin to work out that he had to take control there's an interview he goes to New York um, uh, about three quarters of the way through the book and he's interviewed by Tom Wolfe, the journalist for uh, Vanity mm -hmm. Fair, I think it was. Um, and Tom Wolfe takes him on, on, drives him to the studio where they're going to do the photo session and the interview's still going on, although they've had two or three hours to talk. And he said he was really, really, really struck by Cassius's understanding and acumen of the business, not just of boxing, but of how the media worked. So he kept asking Tom Wolfe, how much do you get paid for a feature? If the feature goes on the front cover, do you get more? Or do they pay you more for being on the front cover? And it, they, there's a bit in the interview where they pass brownstone mansions. This is up in the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And Cassius points out the window and says, you know, the, the, these houses here, what, what, what do you think they're worth now? Right now, what are they worth? And Tom Wolfe's taking a guess. And he says, so as a writer, how many features would you have to write to be able to buy one of these? And he's asking Tom Wolfe all of these questions that he's probably never asked himself, you know? But here's a man that's smart as hell, uh, although he was not, of course, educationally uh, that smart. I mean, Sonny Liston, uh, where he's sitting in the exams, Sonny Liston was always going to beat him in the exams. Uh, but there's something about Cassius that was clever, street smart, really, really kind of of his era, really of his era. Yeah. In the final analysis, mm -hmm. what was it about Cassius X that changed the fight game? What, 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 was, uh, what changed the fight game uh, in terms of Cassius X was he was a boxer that was as knowledgeable and more powerful than the people that managed him, number one. Number two, here was a guy that understood that boxing whether it may involve violence or whatever, is also a branch of entertainment. And that you have to bring crowds, you have to cultivate excitement about your fights. And he went out of his way. There's a very interesting thing early in the, uh, in the book when he's training in Miami, he, 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 he traps a photographer, very brilliant photographer called uh, Flip Shoke, who was um, quite, a, he was a Miami-based photographer, but had, you know, great um, photographs in all the big magazines of the time. And he said to Flip Shoke, tell me what makes a cover photograph. I need to get on the cover of magazines. Mm -hmm. And Flip Shoke said to him, well, I've actually only ever had one cover myself. And that was, I was doing some underwater um, filming of the French underwater explorer Jacques Cousteau. And he says, so it really helped that I was underwater with my, uh, you know, my cameras that worked um, underneath. Cassius immediately said to him, you know what, I, I train every morning underwater. Now he couldn't swim. But he realised that this photographer might get him on the front cover of Life magazine. So they turn up the next day at the hotel, the, uh, Sir John Mattel, where he was based. It was a great kind of soul club there, but I'll not get distracted. <laughs> and they get the, they get the uh, scuba diving equipment and Cassius goes into the water and he's boxing and there's some just incredible photographs and he ended up with his front cover. But he befriended photographers throughout his entire life. He thought they were more important than writers because he thought that they could get you a double spread or a front cover in the way that the writer would be commissioned to a lot of words. That was one of his debates with Tom Wolfe. How many words are they going to let you have? And this was him assessing whether it was worth his while actually even talking to this guy, you yeah. know? Um, but, you know, a brilliantly smart man. Um, and uh, I think one of the, the, the great figures of the 20th century, as you said earlier. And you say you didn't want to get sidetracked into talking about the music there, but you've got, you, you, you reference so many tracks yeah. in the course of this book. Yeah. Um, and some of them completely, utterly obscure. You know, yeah. somebody that Cassius Clay just was in a nightclub with and you tell us this entire disc. Have you got all those singles in your house? Well, actually, do you know what? There's one that I don't have um, and it's early on in the, the thing where, um, <laughs> you know what I do? This is, this is going to sound, you know, that uh, you're going to get the polis to me now. But <laughs> when I'm writing a book, I'm obsessed with who they were at school with. Right, so I'll I'll put down Cassius uh, Marcellus Clay or Cassius X as he was in the era of the book, uh, Central High School Louisville between the ages of you know twelve to sixteen, and I'll work out what time he was at school, 
I'll then go on to the, the website of the, of the school, scroll down till I find out where their uh, former pupil's Facebook page is, and scroll through that to find people that might have been his contemporaries. And then I send them a Facebook message and chat away with them and get little nuggets and things like that. So for example, I know that he was uh, at school um, with, a, with a soul singer called Sonny Fisher. He, he, his real name was Fishback, but he, he uh, shortened it to Fisher. And he has one record on the Northern Soul scene. It's a four grand record, so I don't have that, but uh, I'll, I'll find a way of getting it, but I don't have it now. But that, that would be someone who was typical of the independent music scene in the southern states of America at that time. Uh, and there's another guy called Wendell Brown who was a year below him at Central in, in Louisville. And he ended up being a great, great um, uh, music director for Chess Records, for Minnie Ripperton, for um, the Dells, uh, endless great acts. So I love those little kind of moments where they were in a bus with each other or they sat next to each other. Um, and Sonny, for all, you know, God love him, he ended up going to jail and come out, and now he actually is a, a, he's a guide at the Muhammad Ali Museum in Louisville, you know, so I, I got in touch with him and checked him out in that, you know. That's cool, I mean, that just brings everything full circle, but the, yeah. the, 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 the intensity of your research is remarkable, I have to say. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's no stone left unturned, and, and, yeah. but not in a heavy-handed way. Wait, yeah, you no, know, it's, it's, Some, sometimes you can research for three days and get one line, you know. Yeah. But that, yeah. to some extent, you know, you need to enrich your books with those kinds of little insights and little kind of bits of sparkle. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes it works. And when it does, it feels like a good day. It's always the questions you didn't ask, the, 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 the things you stumble over yeah. in the course of looking for something else, else that make yeah. you excited, isn't That's it? That's exactly that. So yeah, yeah, exactly that. I know that feeling myself. Yeah, yeah. yeah indeed, yeah. yeah. So to finish off with, really, do you think his iconic status has survived? Uh, yes, I do, actually, uh, and I think that that's true for a range of different reasons. That A generation saw him as the cavalier boxer in the 70s. A lot of people fell in love with him around Vietnam and, and the fact that he took a stand against Vietnam, which, uh, I mean, it's, there's a complicated court case around it because it tends to be just simply that you uh, say, well, Muhammad Ali stood up against the Vietnam War, but when he went to court on it, and he was being challenged, one of the weaknesses in his defense was that he said he was a pacifist. And uh, the uh, opposing uh, lawyers for, 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 the, for the military, for the army said to him, you say you're a pacifist, but you say you're also a proud member of the Nation of Islam. Would you fight jihad? And he said, yes, I would fight a holy war, but not a war that I don't think has dignity and all the rest of it and he lost his case as being a pacifist. The definition of a pacifist is you wouldn't fight a war, but he conceded he would fight in jihad. Um, he managed to get off in the end and actually a, a technicality that they challenged him under the wrong part of the uh, code of governance and he ended up uh, being freed. But I think his stance in Vietnam at the time just be, simply became that he was opposed to the war and that was enough for a generation mm -hmm. to fall in love with this guy. And then of course when he lit the Olympic flame by which time you know, he had Parkinson's, he for another generation became this remarkable character standing up to all the brutality of a f physical uh, disorder. So you know, a, a great, great character full of com complexity. Finally, one final thing. I know you asked me this earlier on, Val, why did he join uh, the Nation of Islam, which at the time was effectively a back nationalist uh, organization? Mm. I can only answer you this, and that is that Malcolm X came to the UK uh, to speak uh, at the Oxford Union. And he was speaking on the basis of when it was right to be uh, aggressive about the political needs that you had. And he was putting the case for. Mm -hmm. The person who was the seconder for Malcolm X on that night was the Scottish philosophical, political and cultural uh, figure, Hugh McDermott. So the idea of Malcolm X and Hugh McDermott <laughs> <laughs> together in the same room, uh, you know, that's just the play that the Traverse Theatre needs to write, you know. Now there's anti syzygy if there ever was any. Exactly, yeah. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> oh, Stuart, this has been great. Yeah, I could sit and talk to you yeah. all, all, all morning here, but thank you for taking thank us you. so eloquently through this engrossing and revelatory read. 
It's impeccably indexed, as I've hinted at. It's got an encyclopedic biography, uh, bi bibli bi bibliography. Bibliography, Big yeah. word early in the morning. Yeah. And a great playlist. Aye, Trust indeed. me, you do not have to be a fan of boxing or soul music to love this book. Yeah, very much. Cassius X, here it is. And thank you for tuning in with us this morning. Thank you for being with us. Uh, if you want to buy this book, and why would you not, frankly, and any other book that's coming up over the festival, you can get it at the online bookshop that belongs to the festival, which is shop.edbookfest.co.uk. Shop.edbookfest.co.uk. You can buy lots and lots of books there. It's an absolute cornucopia of wonderfulness. This and year, I, so I understand they're also providing a mechanism whereby I can sign the books and then they're uh, sent on to yep. people that have bought them. So there you go. It's, it's, it's a win win. Win win, uh, yeah. So this year's festival programme is free of charge for everyone. It's been made possible by the generosity of supporters and sport and sport. My mouth's gone. <laughs> Supporters and donors. If you've enjoyed this event, I would be delighted if you'd feel able to make a donation to the Edinburgh International Book Festival so they can continue the work that they do of putting on events for as many people as possible. Thanks for being here with us this morning and thank you, Stuart. Thank you very much indeed, Val. An absolute pleasure. Thank you.